If you would like to follow along in the reading of God's Word this evening, if you would turn to Isaiah 58, uh, remembering again the topical nature of this study, we're only going to be here for just a moment before we launch off into other areas, actually the same area, but at least in different parts of Scripture. Uh, what we see here is a rebuke against the Lord's people for uh, a form of worship that they were offering to Him, but a worship without heart, a worship without the right motives. Uh, just reminding us that we are able, at least man is able, to offer to God a form of worship that is unacceptable to Him. Uh, we, we realize that as Christians we will worship the Lord, we will do what the Lord calls us to do, but just because we do those things it doesn't mean that we have, are genuine believers. Isaiah 58, would you listen carefully to God's Word? Isaiah writes, cried loudly, do not hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet and declare to my people their transgression and to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me day by day and delight to know my ways as a nation that has done righteousness and has not forsaken the ordinance of their God. They ask me for just decisions. They delight in the nearness of God. Why have we fasted and you don't see? Why have we humbled ourselves and you do not notice? Behold, on the day of your fast you find your desire and drive hard all your workers. Behold, you fast for contention and strife and to strike with a wicked fist. You do not fast like you do today to make your voice heard on high. Is it a fast like this which I choose, a day for a man to humble himself? Is it for bowing one head like a reed and for spreading out sackcloth and ashes as a bed? Will you call this a fast, even an acceptable day to the Lord? Is this not the fast which I choose to loosen the bonds of wickedness, to undo the bands of the yoke, and to let the oppressed go free and break every yoke? Is it not to divide your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into the house when you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? Then your light will break out like the dawn and your recovery will speedily spring forth, and your righteousness will go before you. The glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer. You will cry, and He will say, Here I am. If you remove the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness, and if you give yourself to the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then your light will rise in darkness, and your gloom will become like midday. And the Lord will continually guide you and satisfy your desire in scorched places and give strength to your bones and you will be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. And those from among you will rebuild the ancient ruins. You will raise up the age-old foundations and you will be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of the streets in which to dwell. If because of the Sabbath you turn your foot from doing your own pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord honorable, and shall honor it, desisting from your own ways, from seeking your own pleasure, and speaking your own word. Then you will delight, or take delight in the Lord, and I will make you ride on the heights of the earth, and I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. You know, we really have a summary here of what we've been looking at, don't we? Because uh, uh, here we see a false kind of worship, that the Lord is reproving them for and telling them that how it is that they need to correct that. But the point is, of course, that uh, just because we do worship in some way, just because we have a form of worship, does not mean that we are genuinely converted. And we're going to look at that in a little bit of a little more detail this evening. First of all, by way of review, we do know that Edwards has been teaching us two main things. First of all, True religion, what Edwards calls true religion, the relationship that saves us is a matter of the heart. It is a matter of the affections. We are not saved by believing or by merely by believing correct doctrine, although we cannot be saved without it. We must love the Lord our God. We must love Him with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. That is the essence of a true relationship with God. But second, he reminded us that our affections can also deceive us. For every true affection, there is a counterfeit affection. 
just as Satan can counterfeit the fountain of all the affections, that is, he can counterfeit love, so he can counterfeit everything that flows out of it. Edwards told us that out of a genuine godly love flow all of the fruits of God's grace, all of the marks of, of uh, salvation, of marks of grace, uh, all those uh, Christ-like characteristics. But in the same way, out of a uh, counterfeit love will flow everything else that looks like it but is not genuine. And of course the thing that's missing is that genuine love. Now last week we saw one of the ways, one more of those ways, that the enemy can counterfeit saving grace. We saw, something I don't want us to forget, that before the Lord saves us, he first of all makes us concerned about uh, the state of our souls. Now some deny this and they say that the Lord uh, generally brings people to himself and wants to bring people to himself purely out of the uh, revelation out of his love. Just tell people that love, you know, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Have you ever seen that before? Okay, what's wrong with that? Well, it may not be true for one thing because God doesn't necessarily love everyone in that way, but he wants to remind us of something else before he reveals his love to us and that, of course, is his law. Uh, you really don't understand God's love and mercy. You really don't see your need of it until you understand your spiritual state coming into the world apart from Christ and the danger that you are in because of that state. The Lord usually, and I would probably have to say uh, exclusively or always, makes you aware of your danger, at least in some degree, before he delivers you from it so that you will realize what it is he has done for you. I mean, if you're going to be a thankful people, you have to see what it is that God has done for you in order to be thankful. And that's the reason why when the Lord sent his son or before he sent his son to begin his ministry, he sent John the Baptist to prepare his way. And the message that John the Baptist preached was not God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life, but he says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand and he began to preach the law to get them ready so that they would be thoroughly convicted of their sins and be ready for the Savior when he presented himself. And of course Christ comes after him preaching the kingdom, preaching the message of repentance as well, but reminding them what it is they needed to do in order to be saved from the wrath to come. I mean, Jesus offers salvation, but it's salvation from a, a revealed danger that we need to know about. You have to hear the law, you have to feel its condemnation before you will ever come to Christ to set you free. And that's why also, if you are ever to lead someone to Christ, you have to go about it that way. I'm reminded of a gentleman who is in the OPC who owns a bookstore and he, he had a gal come up to the counter and, and he, the gal asked, do you sell the four spiritual laws? And he said, no. And he said, why not? Or the gal said, why not? And he goes, because there's not enough laws. <laughs> Not enough laws. Four spirit, there's ten spiritual laws, you see. And you need to know what those ten laws are before you're going to understand anything about the gospel. No one ever comes savingly to Christ who hasn't first seen the danger that they are in. But Edwards wanted to point out to us, on the other hand, just because you have experienced some concern for your soul, something of the terror of God's judgment, some degree of conviction, and then have experienced some relief through the gospel, perhaps uh, some sense of joy or love in believing that he has forgiven you. That doesn't mean necessarily that he has. If the devil can counterfeit all the saving graces of the Holy Spirit, he can also counterfeit these uh, graces or these things the Spirit does to prepare you for grace. He can bring false conviction. He can bring false fear. And those that the Spirit uh, brings once he has saved you a false comfort, a false joy. And if he can counterfeit those graces, he can also counterfeit the order in which they come. Again, the one thing he can't counterfeit is the nature of the Spirit's work. He can do something like it, but he can't make it exactly like that. But sadly, if we don't know the difference, we can't distinguish between the two. Now this is one of the reasons why the Scripture never points to those particular evidences uh, as proving that we are saved. Uh, the scripture doesn't also experience, has shown us many times, that those who go forward at an evangelistic meeting because they have 
felt something of that conviction and something of the terrors of the law and have prayed that prayer, you know, the sinner's prayer, and have experienced some relief from their concern, uh, you know, because of the message of the gospel and felt relief at the altar. You know, they call it come to the altar. You know, there's, there's no altar in the Christian church, but they, they say come to the altar. Just because they've done that, I mean, we've seen many do that, and yet in the end have still departed from Christ and returned to their former way of life. Now, it is true that you must be concerned for your soul. You must see your danger before you're going to come savingly to Christ, but just because you have experienced some concern about your need of Christ and, and have experienced some degree of comfort that comes from the gospel, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're saved. I hope you see the difference between those two things. Now this evening we're going to consider something further and that is those evidences that we typically, or at least the church in general, typically associates with being a Christian. I mean, how do you know that a person is a Christian? What is it that people look for? What is it that those who, who tell people to come forward for the altar call and then, you know, if you prayed that prayer and you meant that, then you're a Christian. What is it they're going to look for next? Well, I imagine it's going to be whether or not they're going to do the things we typically associate with being Christian, which is they're going to read their Bibles. They're going to pray. They're going to sing. They're going to attend the worship services and listen to sermons. They're going to praise and glorify God publicly, uh, not only together in the worship service, but they're also going to tell other people out there about the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what if you do these things? And what if you do them a lot? What if you give a great deal of time to do these things? What does it say about you? Does it mean that you're a true believer? Well, Edwards is going to tell us again, not necessarily. And we want to consider that for a few moments this evening. Now, first of all, just because you put a great deal of effort into those things we typically associate with being a Christian, doesn't necessarily mean that you're a Christian. Now we've got to look at both sides of this again and as we look at the positive side I want you to be encouraged to do these things because yes genuine grace will produce these kinds of fruits in your lives. Now first of all if you are a true believer you will put effort into these things. You will read your Bible. You will pray. You will sing. You will go to worship. You will listen to the sermons. This is what grace produces in the hearts. It makes you want to do those things uh, that will draw you near to God because, of course, the Christian loves God. Now, as we look at the Bible, we see that this is the universal testimony of the saints. Consider a few examples. Anna the prophetess. You know, what is it that Anna did with her life? Well, the Bible says she spent most of her time in the temple serving the Lord. Luke writes in Luke 2, verses 36 through 37. She was advanced in years and had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, serving night and day with fastings and prayers. Now realize that not everyone who's a Christian is going to necessarily do that. Otherwise, we'd never leave this building and we'd have to continue to bring food to those that, that well, actually with the fastings, maybe not so much food. But... Um, continually feed and take care of those that would be in here doing this. Obviously, the Lord had placed a unique call in her life, but look at how she used her life in prayers and fastings continually. We read about the early believers in Jerusalem, remember those thousands that were converted on the day of Pentecost, that were meeting in the temple on a daily basis and breaking bread from house to house with a glad heart, praising God. That's what grace does. But Daniel, backing up into the Old Testament, regularly prayed three times a day according to David's example in Psalm 55, 16 through 18 where David writes this, As for me, I shall call upon God and the Lord will save me. Evening and morning and at noon I will complain and murmur and he will hear my voice. He will redeem my soul in peace from the battle which is against me for they are many who strive with me. I'll bet you that Daniel read that passage several times as he sought the Lord because he was, after all, in, in Babylon, a place I'm sure he'd prefer not to be and uh, would rather be with uh, God's people in, in the promised land, back in the land promised to Abraham. But Daniel, realizing his situation and knowing, even under the, the threat of death, remember when the king made that, uh, 
that particular law uh, at the prompting of his officials that hated Daniel and wanted to get him out of the way. Daniel continued to pray because that's what grace does. It makes you want to pray. Grace in your heart makes you want to sing praises to the Lord according to what we read again and again in the Psalms. And what does the psalmist often tell us? Praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise Him, O servants of the Lord. You who stand in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of our God. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing praises to His name, for it is lovely. Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant. And praise is becoming. If you love the Lord, you desire to praise Him, and you desire to call upon others to praise the Lord with you. That's what grace does in the heart. Grace makes you want to hear God's Word, and especially the law, which, again, we think about how the church, the, uh, the broad evangelical church, looks at the law of God today and often you know, looks at it as something to be despised, you know, away with this law and so forth. This, uh, I, I'm again reminded of that uh, particular thing that Lewis Berry Chafer said that... Uh, Remember, we studied this in, in college, in a dispensational college that I went to, and, and that is when the Lord appeared on Mount Sinai and He presented to His people the Ten Commandments. What, should, what was their response? Well, everything the Lord has said, we will do. Well, that's, that was a good response. But Chafer says that was a bad response. They should have said, away with this law. We want nothing to do with it. You know, Give us grace instead. Well, what would you think God would have done to them if they would have said that? We know what, they, what he did or, or desired to do when they conveniently set it aside and began to go after other gods. You don't set aside the law of God. The law is something that shouldn't have to be imposed on a Christian. It's something that, that the Christian should love because he delights in it. It reflects the, the image of God. I mean, listen to Psalm 1, verses 1 and 2. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. Psalm 119, verse 97, Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. And then verses 35 and 47 and 48 of Psalm 119, Make me walk in the path of your commandment, for I delight in it. I shall delight in your commandments, which I love, and I shall lift up my hands to your commandments, which I love, and I will meditate on your statutes. It sound to me like the, these uh, believers of the Old Covenant uh, hated God's law. They actually loved the law. And Paul reminds us in Romans chapter 7, the law is righteous and holy and good. It is not something that is evil somehow. You know, do away with the law. It's not the law's fault. You know, there's nothing wrong with the law, as Paul reminds us. It has to do with us. The problem is with us. That's why God brings in a new covenant. When he says, they didn't care for my, for my law, basically, and, and I didn't care for them, well, I'm going to bring a new covenant in and make it with the house of Israel. I'm going to write that law on your hearts. And then you will love me, and then you will walk in my ways, and then I will be your God, and you will be my people. That's what the Lord tells us of the blessings of the new covenant. Grace makes us love God's law. It makes us love his whole word, everything in it, and even that, again, which so many believers today find to be so distasteful. Grace will make you also love those who bring you the Word of God. Isaiah 52, 7, How lovely on the mountains are the feet of Him who brings good news, who announces peace and brings good news of happiness, who announces salvation and says to Zion, Your God reigns. I mean, how, how have we appreciated those that brought the Word of God to us to begin with and that we have learned from and benefited from. It's, it's, it, you know, it's, it's a blessing because God's Word is a blessing. If we love His Word, we'll love those that are able to bring it to us. It will make you love public worship. David writes in Psalm 26, verses 5 through 8, I hate the assembly of evildoers, and I will not sit with the wicked. I shall wash my hands in innocence, and I will go about your altar, O Lord, that I may proclaim with the voice of thanksgiving and declare all your wonders. O Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Psalm 27, verse 4, again, David writes, One thing I have asked from the Lord, that I shall seek, 
that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. And then another psalmist in Psalm 84 writes, How lovely are your dwelling places, O Lord of hosts! My soul longed and even yearned for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. The bird also has found a house and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young, even your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. How blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand outside. I would rather stand at the threshold of the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. Now this is what the grace of God does in our hearts. It gives to us a desire to worship the Lord, to gather together publicly with God's people to worship Him, also to worship in private, to read His Word, to know more of Him, and to commune with Him, to use the means of communion with Him so that we might draw near to Him. So we don't want to mistake this. I mean, Edwards is not saying that uh, Christians don't do these things. Obviously, they do. But he wants to remind us that just because you do something like this doesn't mean that the Spirit is the one who is moving you to do these things because counterfeit love can also bring counterfeit worship. And there are many examples in scriptures, in the scriptures of those who spent a great deal of time in worship and yet they were unconverted. Uh, there's a passage in Isaiah chapter 1 verses 12 through 15 where the Lord reminds his people that their attendance upon the new moons and their observation of the Sabbath, their called assemblies, their spreading out their hands to heaven and their praying of many prayers were not acceptable to him. He says this, when you come to appear before me, who requires of you this trampling of my courts? Bring your worthless offerings no longer. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath, the calling of assemblies. I cannot endure iniquity and the solemn assembly. I hate your new moon festivals and your appointed feasts. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. So when you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Yes, even though you multiply prayers, I will not listen. The interesting thing is they were doing what it is that God called them to do. They had the form of godliness, but they didn't have the heart. And because they were coming under false pretenses to the Lord, God said, I'm not going to accept this at all. We know in the, the New Testament, the Pharisees made long prayers. They fasted twice a week. But you know what the Lord thought about the Pharisees. Our text reminds us in Isaiah 58, where we began, of those Jews who sought the Lord daily who said they delighted to know God's ways and they fasted often. But again, the Lord reproves them for that. We read in the book of Ezekiel that there were many who would come and listen to Ezekiel declare the word of the Lord and yet they would not do what he said. Now, Ezekiel 33, 31 through 32. They come to you as people come and sit before you as my people and hear your words, but they do not do them. For they do the lustful desires expressed by their mouth, and their heart goes after their gain. Behold, you are to them like a sensual song by one who has a beautiful voice and plays well on an instrument. For they hear your words, but they do not practice them. King Herod enjoyed listening to John the Baptist, right? And, of course, there were many who enjoyed listening to him and were willing to rejoice in his light for a season. If you recall, we also saw the stony ground hearers. You know, they listen to the evangelists. They hear those words. They hear the gospel. They receive it with joy. And yet, when the heat of the trial comes along, they wither away because there was no depth to their Christianity at all. Experience shows us that those involved in false religions can do exactly the same thing, even those who believe themselves to be genuine believers. They may devote themselves more to their acts of worship than genuine believers do. I mean, think about the sacrifices that monks and nuns have made throughout the centuries as they go into, into their monasteries and their convents. The, they have to give up all their worldly possessions. They have to make a vow of poverty and chastity and obedience uh, to their superiors. The Jehovah's Witnesses, you know, they often outstrip us in their zeal for evangelism. We can't really call that evangelism. 
but going door to door seeking to proselyte people. They have a great amount of zeal for their religion. And Muslims pray five times a day, every day, toward Mecca at dawn, noon, mid-afternoon, sunset, and night. You see, Daniel only prayed three times. They pray five times. They were more devoted to uh, their religion. Well, the point is, if you are a true believer, you will pray. Okay, you will sing. You will read the Bible. You will listen to sermons. You will go to worship. And you will do it often. But just because you do these things, it doesn't mean that you are a genuine Christian. So engaging in acts of worship, don't look just to that as whether or not you are saved. Now, if, if you're not doing that, you can know you're not saved. Okay? But if you're doing those things, you still need to judge the motive behind them. Now, one other thing that was very similar to this that I'd like to deal with briefly, and that is uh, just because you may spend a great deal of time praising and glorifying God publicly doesn't mean that you're a genuine Christian. Edwards is really, is really um, he thinks so deeply into these subjects, sometimes he makes distinctions. We wonder, well, what's the difference between this and the thing we just saw? In his mind, there was a distinction. I was trying to figure out what it was, and I, I think that what he meant by this was that there are certain things that we will do uh, publicly as the people of God, but all the examples that he gives under this category are those things that we do more publicly out there in front of the world that we will be willing to give public praise and glory to God if we are genuine believers. But just because we do that doesn't mean that we are genuine Christians. Okay, so first of all, if we love the Lord, certainly we will do that. And what did Jesus say? That if we confess Him before men, He will confess us before the Father who is in heaven. But if you deny Him before men, He will deny you before the Father who is in heaven. How can you deny one that has loved you so much and one that you love so much in the face of someone who, who might be able to harm your body but can't touch your soul. The Lord tells us genuine Christians are those who will, uh, as a, a matter of life, confess the Lord and give Him public praise. But consider again in the Scriptures those who did so publicly, who praised Him and glorified Him who were not converted. The Israelites whom the Lord delivered out of Egypt. Once the Egyptian army was drowned in the Red Sea, they sang the song of Moses and gave public praise to the Lord. When Jesus healed the paralytic, there were many who praised God. After he issued the command to the paralytic, get up, take up your pallet and walk, he got up and immediately picked up the pallet and went out in the sight of everyone so that they were all amazed and were glorifying God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. Same thing happened when Jesus made the dumb to speak, when he made the lame to walk, the blind to see. Um, the Jews glorified the God of Israel. And when he raised the dead son of the widow of Nain, Luke 7, 16, fear gripped them all and they began glorifying God, saying, a great prophet has arisen among us and God has visited his people. When Jesus taught in the synagogues, all glorified him and were speaking well of him and gave glory to God. And as we've already seen, when he entered into Jerusalem, they all cried out with loud voices, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And yet shortly after these things, these same people uh, cried out publicly for his death. Now how many do you know who have professed Christ as their Savior and their Lord publicly and have told others about Him, perhaps were even zealous, uh, looked very much like, uh, you know, uh, well, that God had given them even a, a gift of evangelism, and yet later have turned away from Him entirely. You know, these things should stand as a warning to us not to rest in the fact that we have publicly professed the Lord Jesus Christ or glorified Him or that we engage in these... Uh, various duties of Christian worship. We ought to be doing these things. These things ought to be true of us if we are genuine believers. And I hope that uh, the many examples that we have seen of these things will encourage us to pursue those things. You know, that we will get those things out of the way that, that hinder us from doing those things. Those uh, desires after the world and those, uh, uh, that fear of man that would keep us from publicly proclaiming him and those things that would 
you know, again, I'm preaching to the choir in this case, that would keep us from coming to public worship, or at least evening worship. Uh, we have a number that come in the morning that, that don't come back in the evening, and you know, perhaps their schedules do prohibit that, but if there isn't anything prohibiting that, we really ought to be here. Uh, if, if we're not, something is getting in the way that shouldn't be getting in the way. And whatever those things might be in other areas of worship for us, this should encourage us to push those things aside, to put those things to death, so that we will want to be here and worship the Lord, not just for our benefit, but because God is worthy of our praise and our worship. So this should be an encouragement to us to pursue those things, but at the same time, we don't want to rest in that alone for our conviction, our assurance that we are genuine believers because those things can be counterfeited. We do need to make sure that we're looking at our hearts when we do this and we're doing it for the right reasons because we really do love the Father and we want to honor Him. We really do love the Son and we want to honor Him not just because of the great and infinite gift that He has given to us of eternal life, deliverance from hell, but also because we love them. You know, we really love the Father and the Son. We really want to spend time. We really want uh, publicly to glorify and honor Him. That's what genuine grace will produce. Well, let's spend a few moments and let's uh, ask the Lord again to search our hearts and to show us uh, what we need to see this evening.